Good evening, and welcome to the 36th annual Scylla Lecture. Whether this is your first lecture or your 36th, we're very happy to have you with us this evening. My name is Jane Kirtley, and I'm the Scylla Professor of Media Ethics and Law and the Director of the Scylla Center here at the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication. In just a few minutes, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but first, I'd like to introduce to you the director of the Hubbard School of Journalism, Dr. Alicia Cohen. Alicia. Thank you, Jane. As director of the Hubbard School, I'm delighted to be with you tonight to introduce our programming that is made possible through the Silha Center. The Silha Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law was established in 1984 with a generous endowment from Otto and Helen Silha. Located within the Hubbard School, of Journalism and Mass Communication and the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota, the Silha Center is the school's vanguard of the school's interest and commitment to the study of the ethical responsibilities and legal rights of the mass media in a democratic society. Tonight's lecture is also part of the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts Public Life Project programming. The school is pleased to leverage its centers of excellence, including the Silha Center and its Minnesota Journalism Center to contribute to programming and outreach that hopes to elevate conversations about public life in Minnesota and beyond. Tonight's conversation will consider important questions such as how can we hope to mitigate political polarization and advance the core purposes of the First Amendment in our democratic society. Now I'm pleased to introduce again Silha Professor of Media Ethics and Law, Jane Kirtley, Director of our Silla Center, to formally introduce our speaker this evening. Jane, back to you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to uh, establish for everybody the ground rules of how we'll be operating this evening. You will notice that the Q&A function at the base of your screen is available, and you should feel free to put any questions at any point during the lecture that you'd like to pose to our lecturer. I will be curating those questions and I'll ask as many as I can after she completes uh, the present, her formal presentation. Um, you are all muted. Uh, your screens are uh, not being seen by us. So we aren't seeing you this evening, but we know you're out there and we really hope that you will ask questions after Janelle finishes her presentation. So let me introduce our speaker. It's a real pleasure for me uh, that Janelle Trigg agreed to give our Scylla lecture this year. Janelle and I go back a long way. Um, we've done a lot of work together on, uh, particularly on data privacy issues uh, for a number of uh, international conferences uh, for lawyers and, and other media specialists. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for her um, because you know, in a very real way, she uh, exemplifies what I think is, is the best of the media bar, uh, the lawyers that practice law in these important areas that are so central to everybody, but certainly to the Hubbard School. It's really fascinating to me how, as the British say, she checks every box um, that uh, really represents what our school is all about. And I know she'll be sharing a lot of her interesting experiences with you during her presentation. Um, I need to start by introducing her and saying that on the slide you saw earlier, uh, we did not correctly identify her practice group because the name of it has changed. She is a member of Lerman Center, um, the law, a law firm in Washington, DC, uh, where she is the chair of the Privacy, Data Protection and Cybersecurity Practice Group. She's also the director for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. She's had a most remarkable career, and many of you have already read about it, but I just want to hit a few highlights. She had a 16-year career as a broadcast television sales and marketing executive in some major markets here in, in the United States. After that, she earned her law degree, her JD, uh, with honor, from the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. And for some of you with long memories, just as a, a footnote, Bob Corn Revere, who was our 2007 Silla lecturer, is also a graduate of the Columbus School of Law. Um, after she got her law degree, she worked at the Federal Communications Commission and as Assistant Chief Counsel for Telecommunications at U.S. Small Business Administration. She is the first African-American partner at Lerman Center, 
and she's nationally recognized for her commitment and dedication to promoting minority women and small business ownership and employment in the media and communications industry. And we all know how important all of that is and how unfortunately it still remains almost more of an aspiration than a reality. Um, she's received many, many awards, and the two that I'll just mention are Lifetime Achievement Award from the Rainbow Push Coalition and the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. She and I talked at length about what she would talk about tonight because Janelle has such a rich treasure trove of experiences to draw upon. Um, the title of her lecture is The First Amendment Diversity, a Marketplace Failure. And I look forward, along with you, to hearing what Janelle has to say about it. So please take it away, Janelle. Oh, thank you, Jane. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, BCR was my first amendment in the media professor at law school. Uh, so that was uh, a family event, I think. Uh, Dr. Cohen, thank you for your very warm welcome. I certainly appreciate uh, this wonderful invitation. I'm very honored to join you today. So good evening, everyone. Now, I wish I was there in person. Jay knows that I was really looking forward to walking the campus, spending some time with her, uh, her staff, as well as you, the students and supporters of the Sella Center. And I really regret not being there. Uh, now Dr. Hargrove also knows I was looking forward to visiting George Floyd Square. I really wanted to pay my respects. And I am just so touched that she delivered some of the flyers for this event to the square. And I understand that today you talked to the manager at Cup Foods to post a flyer in the window. So that just really touches me. It's the next best thing to being there. So thank you, Elaine. My special comments today reflect a lot of recent events as well as life experiences. And I think we all know that we are currently in a debate regarding the importance and value of free speech and protecting democracy. Some say there's no democracy without free speech, but after the 2020 presidential election, the insurrection on the nation's capital, recent developments, some too close to home, I'm not sure anymore. I certainly know that some speech should not be free. So I've started to question whether the longstanding theory of marketplace of ideas is still relevant in today's digital age. Now, I am not a First Amendment scholar, nor do I claim to play one on TV, but I'm a strong supporter of the First Amendment. And I fully understand that the First Amendment was designed not to protect the speech we like, but to protect the speech we don't. So I'm a longstanding supporter of diversity, as Jane mentioned, particularly diversity in the media, because I think that makes a real difference overall. And that's one of the reasons I went to law school. So I believe there's a strong correlation between diversity in the media, First Amendment, and today's state of the marketplace of ideas as it exists or not. I mentioned my family history and life story play a formative role and how I view these issues. Everything I've done in my professional and personal life has come to lead me here today. But had you told 20 year old me, a professionally trained singer who could act and dance a little, just graduating from Northwestern University with a Bachelor of Science in Speech and a major in Theater Arts, that I'd be lecturing about the First Amendment in law today, I would not have believed you. Okay, I'm trying to change my screen. There we go. Enough about me. As you see, I had planned to do Dream Girls on Broadway not telecommunications law in Washington, DC. So how did I get here? And why are these issues so important to the First Amendment, important to me, important to you, and important to future generations? Let's start from the beginning. Oops, that's just a little too far back. That's more like it. 
Well into my broadcast career, I decided to attend law school. In fact, law school was my 40th birthday present to myself. At the time, I was national sales manager and director of marketing for WJZ TV, the Group W Broadcasting Station in Baltimore, the ABC affiliate. I spent almost 16 years on the commercial side of the media business, another two years on the agency side of it. And I started out at Leo Burnett Advertising in Chicago as a media buyer planner. Now my parents had no idea what a media buyer planner was, but they were just grateful that I had a real job. So going to law school was a surprise for my family and very much a surprise for my colleagues in television. This was not a spontaneous, nor was this an easy decision. And it's one I reach as an assessment that I do in my life 20 years ago. I've had the pleasure of working for local television stations, network owned, group owned, as well as family owned. And I believe that I'm the only person who's ever worked at the FCC that has also worked for an ABC, NBC, CBS and Fox affiliate. And the all the way to the FCC baby was uh, an inscription on the inside of a gift a colleague of mine at WJC gave me on the first day I started law school. And the book was Lawyers and Other Reptiles. And on the inside, she said, Janelle, good luck, all the way to the FCC baby. So I went to law school because I was unfulfilled in my job as a broadcast sales and marketing executive, and I was very unsure about my future. Throughout my career, I was often the only woman or the only African-American or the only minority woman in sales. I rarely saw anyone that looked like me on the business side, particularly in management, but I loved the field of television. It was close enough to the theater and it paid the rent. And notwithstanding several sales records and noteworthy accomplishments in both Chicago and Baltimore, I felt very vulnerable. I needed job security. I wanted maximum career flexibility. And as a black woman, I felt that I needed an advanced degree to move up the corporate ladder. So I decided that law school, but with a focus on communications law was the answer. I plan to be a broadcast lawyer, stay in the corporate world, move from sales to the legal department at Group W. So I kept my sales management mortgage paying job during the day and commuted from Baltimore to Washington to school at night. Yes, I'm a very proud evening student. Fast forward to my second year of law school. And I realized there was more to the study of communications law than just broadcasting rules and regulations, even though those broadcasting rules and regulations made my life miserable as a sales manager. So I made another surprise decision, some say radical. I altered my plans to be a corporate lawyer. Instead, I took a 75% pay cut, yes. 75% to jumpstart my legal career by working at the FCC as a law clerk. That's a fancy name for extern. I had an opportunity to work on wonderful variety of projects. Uh, and the most rewarding were those that addressed minority and small business and women owned issues. These were constituents that had limited resources to lobby the FCC. They didn't have the time to visit Washington, but they had real issues. They did not have a voice. And I found that their issues and concerns were just as important. So I have been the voice for small, minority-owned, women-owned businesses throughout my career. And I have advocated for diversity in ownership and management in communications in the media and all fronts. I've represented larger media clients for their diversity issues. And I have represented J schools and other nonprofit organizations on a pro bono basis. Now, as I've talked to students, undergrad and graduate, 
journalism, RTBF, communications, law, they're all concerned about the future of media and the future of broadcasting, the future of news media. They, you, are concerned about increasing threats and attacks on journalists and the media around the world. We've all seen these headlines. And we know that these threats come in so many different ways, verbal, physical assaults, arrests and criminal investigations, or the threat of an arrest and criminal investigation, fake news statutes and regulations, access rights to information and civil challenges. Now note that many of these attacks are not partisan. It doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're on. The press and media have been punching bags on an equal opportunity basis. And that concerns me. And I know that you share these concerns. And it is from this perspective that I offer my remarks today. Now, occupational hazard, these remarks are mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Lerman Center or its clients. We know that the First Amendment mandates that no law shall interfere with our freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. The free speech clause is where the marketplace of ideas is grounded, although it may have implications in the other provisions as well. So what exactly is a marketplace of ideas? John Milton advocated for a contest of forces and free press. John Stuart Mill advocated for a free competition of ideas to separate falsehoods from fact. Now this presumption that a robust competition of ideas would ultimately result in the truth and create an informed public was first introduced into our jurisprudence a little over a century ago by Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now in Abrams and United States, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of several Russian immigrants for violating the 1917 Espionage Act. Justice Holmes dissented in that decision. He argued that the leaflets supposedly that they distributed were clear, were not a clear and present danger to the US because they did not have language that was disloyal about the American political system, nor did they concern the war with Germany. He asserted that the leaflets should be protected as free speech, that a free trade in ideas is the best test of truth. And he added, and I quote, every year, if not every day, we have to wager our salvation upon some prophecy based on imperfect knowledge. While that experiment is part of our system, I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so imminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that a, an immediate check to require is required to save the country. That was over a hundred years ago. These words ring true today, just as they did in 1919. But does a true marketplace of ideas exist today? I believe that the marketplace is rapidly failing on several aspects in the existence of truly independent and antagonistic voices, I call these diverse viewpoints. In our exposure to diverse viewpoints and in our consumption of diverse viewpoints. I have a theory of why we are where we are. It is simply a theory at this point, but I think it's worth exploring. I believe that there are several distinct individual developments that have changed our consumption of news and information, as well as our trust in the news and media industry, and therefore have impacted the marketplace of ideas. Each one of these developments cannot be viewed in isolation. We have to look at each in the context of time and place and how each has served as a catalyst for the next development. 
And the first development, I think, is the consolidation of news and information sources. The second is the increased use of and reliance on impersonal communications. And the third is advanced technology that collects, tracks, analyzes our personal information to predict our behavior and to use such information to generate revenue and engagement. Let's discuss each. It's reported that between all the different sources of news and information, the average consumer has access to thousands, if not millions of choices. Now, some argue that's exactly why the marketplace of ideas is working. That this abundance of choices proves that there is adequate diversity in news and information. But this claim is dependent on how you define diversity. There is no doubt that today's source of news and information are plentiful. As you can see that there are so many new vehicles that deliver news and information today compared to 40 years ago. 40 years ago, when I was in the business, there were just three major television networks and one fledging cable news network. Cable news, cable television was in its infancy. And in 1981, the internet was just a gleam in Al Gore's eye. 40 years ago, there were thousands of local daily newspapers, many publishing a morning and a evening paper edition all with investigative teams, reporters, and a hunger for the truth. Of those, an estimated 3,000 were minority owned. And today, only a fraction remain. And some are only operating with the digital, digital edition. And local newspapers, TV stations, radio stations are operating with reduced staff, especially news staff, or have changed format to include recycled, prepackaged or repackaged content. And in 1983, it was reported that 50 companies owned 90% of the media companies. Whereas today, you can count the number of companies that own 90% of the media on both hands and still have fingers left over. And there are more mergers on the horizon so we expect that number to go down. Now, a substantial number of these sources are owned and operated by the same companies. There's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of vertical integration. Put another way, although there are considerably more sources for news and information than ever before, there are less owners, less truly independent and antagonistic voices and therefore less diverse viewpoints. This is a natural consequence of consolidation. Now the consolidation of the media, particularly broadcast and television, started with the 1996 Telecommunications Act. It was enacted to foster increased competition in the telecom sector and to relax long-standing media ownership rules in radio and television. These rules had limited the number of TV and radio stations one company could own in the US and how many could be owned in an individual market. And while many mergers and acquisitions since the 1996 act made great business sense because they added scale and they added much needed revenue and resources to entities that were underperforming and allowing them to compete better with other types of media sources there was a loss of local owners. NTIA, which is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, noted that after the 1996 Act, local broadcast markets lost an average of one owner per market, with the top 10 markets losing three owners per market. And in that loss, we also had a decline of racial and ethnic diversity and local broadcast radio and TV stations. Now, minority ownership of commercial broadcast and radio stations has always been low since the beginning of broadcasting. Minority owners are consistently underrepresented in the US compared to the number of racial and ethnic persons in the overall population. 
and this includes African American, Asian American, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and those of Hispanic and Latino ethnicity. Significantly, there are a higher percentage of persons of color in the United States today than ever before, an estimated 40%. But there are less minority owners of broadcast and radio stations as well. Now, the largest increase, as you'll see, prior to 1978 came after the FCC's adoption of the so-called minority tax certificate. This tax certificate, section 1071 of the tax code, allowed sellers of broadcast and radio properties or cable properties to defer a capital gains tax if they sold to a minority. So in the late 60s and 70s, during a time of civil unrest, very similar to some of the unrest we have today, it was necessary for the FCC to address the decline or the loss of or the inexistence of minority ownership. They based their proposals and the introduction of the tax certificate on the 1967 Kerner Commission report. This report criticized the media's failure to cover or to accurately portray the African-American community. And the FCC found that licensee programming should fairly reflect the needs and viewpoints of minority groups and to do so to get the diversity of programming that was required, there should be encouraged minority broadcast ownership. And minority ownership stats fluctuated after the 1996 Act. Initially, minority ownership in radio increased because well-financed minority owners were able to take advantage of the new relaxed ownership rules. Radio One, for example, led by the incomparable Kathy Hughes, was the first African-American-owned national radio group. It was a major accomplishment. At its peak, Radio One owned 70 radio stations, the largest number of stations owned by any minority company ever. But let's keep this in perspective. The largest non-minority owned company at the same time had over 1,000 stations. And Radio One proved to be an exception to the rule. Ultimately, minority ownership levels declined because standalone minority owners now competing against larger entities owning multiple radio and TV stations in their market could not compete. And the vast number of minority owners only owned one radio or TV property. Now, Chairman Kennard, who was chairman at the time, raised this issue. He was troubled. And his concern was that there's been bipartisan support and we need to have a diversity of ownership in our stations because it's good for the public and good for democracy. But he was not supported across the board in that. As you can see, there was some concern from Congress. They did not necessarily support Chairman Kennard's position. But today, we have the same concern at the FCC. As you can see, Commissioner Starks is also concerned that broadcasters should look like America. And right now, with the late level of minority ownership and women ownership as well, Broadcasting does not reflect the role our media plays to inform the public. Now, he placed blame with previous administrations. Now, I've never been shy about calling the FCC out when they do something stupid or do something that's unreasonable. And certainly previous administrations could have done more, but there are other legal obstacles that should be considered like discriminatory lending and financing practices that exacerbated the access to capital issues minority and women owners already were, expected, were, were uh, uh, dealing with. Now, I was working at the FCC when the 1996 Act was signed into law, and I witnessed how difficult it was for the commission to meet its statutory mandate to relax broadcast ownership rules 
while protecting minority and women ownership as required by other parts of the statute, such as to serve the public interest, to promote competition, localism, and diversity. And it was very difficult for the FCC to meet Chairman Kennard's desire to promote minority ownership because there were a series of court decisions that imposed a higher legal standard to justify any race-based or any gender-based policy or regulation. These decisions, primarily from the DC Circuit and the United States Supreme Court, severely restricted the FCC's efforts to promote minority ownership and gender ownership in broadcast media. And they continue to impact the FCC's ability to address all industries, telecom, wireless, cable, every regulated entity under the FCC's authority to date. Now we can debate the pros and cons of whether the FCC Act was a good idea, whether it was implemented properly, but that's a subject of a different lecture. Right now, we're dealing with a very small number of minority and women owners in broadcasting today. Combined, minorities represent only three to 4% of the total number of radio and TV stations, but represent 40% of the overall population. Some groups show less than 1% of ownership. And the same is true by gender. Women represent 50% of the total population, but only 8% of the owners. And I provided this chart, may be difficult to read, but it's visually important. If you look at the extended blue bars, the ones that move far into the right, those categories are male, white, and non-Hispanic Latino. The bottom line is that a natural outcome of consolidation, there are less local and less diverse owners of the media and information sources. And the commission has said that the lack of ownership diversity can affect the viewpoint diversity in the marketplace. And that's because minority owners are also, and women owners, are more apt to employ minority employees and women, and that includes journalists, assignment editors, staffers, photojournalists across the board. There's a this is a time where we need more diversity, not just at the ownership level, but at the staff level and newsroom level as well. Now, 40 years ago, it could be argued that Americans had more diverse and independent sources for news and information than we do today. And for cost saving and efficiency reasons, as I mentioned, some news content is recycled, it's repackaged. We repurpose it, it's distributed to affiliated entities. And that is perfectly fine. That's an efficient use of resources. And that's from a business perspective, but let's not call that diversity. It is more difficult today to dismiss a news story as fake news or claim that a particular media outlet is the enemy of the people when the owner of the media property or management have been longstanding residents in your community or members of your church or members of your PTA. And the consequence of consolidation is that we feel less connected to and less trusting of the media and the press. As to our exposure to and engagement with diverse content, we no longer peruse the marketplace as initially presumed by Justice Holmes. Instead, we purposefully seek out and only consume selective news and information that reinforces our own viewpoints and beliefs. And given the exponential advances in technology, such as sophisticated algorithms, predictive and analytics that's used to assess our behavior on the internet and automated programs that deliver content to us, many of our choices of news and information have already been made for us. They've been fed to us directly on our Facebook feeds, timelines, Instagram posts, and chat rooms. It forecloses our ability to consider opposing viewpoints. Now, I like this analogy of a specialty shop 
for today's 21st century marketplace, except that I'd take it a step further. I'd add that the specialty shop is across town and not located near or in the shopping mall where we could at least look through all the windows of the storefronts on our way to our preferred store. So we don't get the opportunity to even see what's out there. That's so much for the opportunity to engage with diverse and antagonistic voices that facilitate robust debate and discussion between rational citizens that will allow truth to ultimately prevail. We only communicate or socialize with like-minded people. We create a continuous echo chamber based on ideology and partisan affiliation. And when we hear different, diverse, and antagonistic news or perspectives, we don't just disagree with the messenger, with the message, we too often loathe the messenger. And such disdain becomes personal. The speaker becomes our enemy. We've heard the term enemy of the people. And as I noted, we label news and information we don't like as fake with little regard for the facts or the truth. Now, speaking of facts, we often have our own set of beliefs to justify our opinions and interpretation of news and information, coining the term alternative facts. That term is now enshrined in the dictionary. And while I support someone's right to use the term, let's be very clear on what it means. Frankly, I never understood how those two words fit together. Alternative in fact, is it just me? A fact is a statement that can be proven true or false, an actual occurrence. Either something is true or it isn't, period. There is no alternative. Now, on the other hand, an opinion is an expression of a person's feelings that cannot be proven. So there are alternative theories, alternative interpretations, and alternative opinions, but not alternative facts. And note that the dictionary definition of alternative facts doesn't include the words true, actual occurrence, or fact for that matter. Now from an old J school principle, there used to be a time when it was forbidden to mix opinion and use. Decades ago, you could clearly delineate the difference between news, opinion, editorial content, and entertainment. It's not so easy anymore. And if John Stuart Mill knew how rapidly alternative facts and other misinformation spread over the internet and is absorbed in the mainframe, he may not have stated that, I quote, wrong opinions should be allowed to spread freely so that they could gain a clearer perception and livelier impression of truth when they finally encountered it. Yeah, right. And why is it important to you at the Scylla Center? Not disclosing the difference between fact and opinion is one of the criticisms the public has of the news media. Why trust in the press and media has declined and continued to erode. More than half of Americans consider this a problem. So I'm not surprised that there has been a loss of trust in the media in recent years, contributing to the public's changing consumption of media and news, limiting the marketplace of ideas. I'm also not surprised that US ranks last among 46 countries in trust of the media. But the good news is that local news ranks higher in trust than national news. And local broadcast is trusted over newspapers by a significant amount. Now the Pew Research Center has done quite a bit of study on public trust in the media and press. And overall, roughly eight in 10 US adults have at least some trust in the accuracy of the political news they get from their main news source, 83% with at least 38% expressing a great deal of trust 
about two in 10 adults expresses a great deal of trust in the accuracy of political news they get from national news organizations. Though a majority, 64%, have at least some trust. But there is also clearly a divide between the level of trust based on political affiliation. Let's break that down further. Pew has also shown that Democrats have a higher level of trust in national news and local news organizations, social media than Republicans. Local news organizations rank higher in trust overall and social media is last by a significant amount. Now I'm puzzled. This is a very low level of trust for social media, regardless of party. But it makes me wonder why people are so engaged with social media. So hold that thought. Where Americans are getting their news also has an impact on the marketplace of ideas. Pew reports that the transition of news from print, television, and radio to digital spaces has caused huge disruptions in traditional news industry. We've seen it firsthand. And this disruption has influenced the way that Americans get their information. Now more than eight get their news from a digital device. Little more than half prefer a digital platform, 52% overall than the other vehicles. Television ranks a strong number two. And of those digital platforms, news websites and apps, <coughs> excuse me, are the number one choice for all adult demographics. Search engines are number two, social media is number three, except for adults 18 to 29 young people are more likely to use social media to access their news. But I'm curious, do young people use social media because they find it more comfortable than compared to us boomers? Or do they trust social media more? And is there a real difference between comfort and trust? Which brings us to the marketplace of ideas increased use of impersonal communications devices. The marketplace is supposed to advance diversity of viewpoints and antagonistic viewpoints. Now the term antagonistic in this context means opposing viewpoints, not hostile viewpoints. We certainly have enough hostile viewpoints, but over the past 25 years, when broadcast, print and cable and media was consolidating, there were also advancements in technology and the development of high-tech PDAs that, and online platforms that changed what we do and how we communicate. These devices and platforms allow us to communicate and interact with anyone in the world to get news and information at very little cost at our choosing 24 seven. This is a very good thing. Now, media platforms are a crucial part of the mainstream modern ecosystem. They've expanded freedom of expression as well as access to news and information across the globe. And again, that's a good thing. But there is a bad side to online engagement and use of communications and high-tech devices. While we can engage with anyone online, we often make such connections and interact with other people at an arm's length basis on an impersonal level. We rarely communicate in person. We tweet, text, IM, email, and ping. We can be anonymous online when sending threatening or hurtful messages or inflammatory content, at least to the recipient. Such content and messages are instantly disseminated around the world and reposted, liked, recirculated well beyond the closed circle of family, friends, and associates when we don't even know the initial origin. We can avoid getting to know each other beyond being a Facebook friend. We can avoid being held accountable for our actions. We have not only lost diversity, we have lost civility. We say things on Facebook, Twitter, and other online media that we would have never said in person, much less than out loud. We can, be, we can hide behind a fake online identity and attack real people. 
It has been reported that this type of speech is a major cause of distress and suicide for children and teens, especially young girls. Body image, race, gender have all been traditional topics for hateful speech and personal attacks. Now it's political viewpoints and party that are the same prime target. In just the past year, the attack on hateful speech has become more and more emboldened, often with the encouragement of powerful and influential people. Now, the most troubling part is that such speech has moved from online to the offline world, which moves us to our number three development. The advanced technology that collects, tracks, analyzes PI to protect individual behavior and uses such information to generate revenue and engagement. As I mentioned earlier, we do not consume news and information with divergent or new viewpoints, and that we only access sources or engage with or tolerate people that share and reinforce our own viewpoints. So it is human nature to support and share the news feeds and posts from, to, from and to like-minded people. But before you repost that news story or information or engage in a communications, are you sure that it came from another human and it was not sent by a bot? Are you sure that the video or content is real or is it a deep fake? Did you know that your personal information, online activities and social networking can be tracked, controlled, and manipulated by advanced technology and that your use of the internet is not as anonymous as you thought. Now we, many of us have seen this New Yorker cartoon. It was the face of the internet because nobody knows you're a dog. Well, that was then, this is now. The internet knows everything about you. And what is called behavioral targeting or behavioral profiling has had a major influence on the failing of the marketplace of ideas for news and information. Now gathering data about consumers' gender, age, location, purchasing, viewing, reading and listening habits, analyzing that data for advertising and marketing purposes is not new. And it is perfectly acceptable it is how the advertising business works. And this is part of what I did while working at Leo Burnett in Chicago. I had access to reams and reams of paper reports and the demographics of certain consumer groups and their estimated past viewing, listening and reading habits collected over a designated period of time in the previous year. This information was critical to determine how to place advertising where to place advertising, should it be in magazines, newspapers, broadcast TV, or even the yellow pages? What should the advertising message be? How best to keep the consumer engaged with my client's product or service? And I would analyze these, this data and then offer my best analysis. And in perfect science, indeed. But a science that supported the billion dollar advertising and marketing industry. Today's consumer research is now streamlined, digitalized. And that's a good thing because it's more efficient. Improved collection of data provides a more accurate assessment than I could years ago, resulting in more relevant and influential advertising, which is the whole purpose of advertising and marketing in the first place. And there's nothing wrong with it. But concerns and issues arise, particularly online, when the collection of data is not based on general categories anymore, but it's based on your individual behavior. Our personal information is collected and analyzed each and every time we visit the internet, even when we use multiple devices or apps called cross-device tracking. Personal information is not limited to just your IP address or email or name. It now includes a history of your internet behavior, such as search and purchase history, likes, dislikes, traits, political beliefs, leanings, 
news feeds, timelines, viewing of ads, any other content, the friends or brands or news stories we like the most or like the least. This data collection is done instantly in real time compared to a designated period of time over the previous year that I used to do. And the data is amassed in an extensive profile and is automatically analyzed using algorithms and machine learning. It takes nanoseconds, not over the weeks it took me to complete. And all of this activity is done behind the scenes of websites and social media platforms involving hundreds and hundreds of unique third-party companies in a vast internet ecosystem. Now, not all commercial websites track behavior data or create a profile on you. And that's why you need to read the privacy policy. I'm probably the only one on this webinar that has read the privacy policy of every website that I've accessed. I've even downloaded a few to keep them for issues that may come up. So our online profile is not just based on our personal information, but it also includes a sophisticated psychoanalysis of what we will likely do in the future. And that's called predictive analysis. I could not imagine how complex and sophisticated this one standard and innocuous practice of profiling and analyzing consumer behavior would become using advanced digital technology. And I certainly could not have imagined that behavioral profiling and predictive analysis would be used not just for advertising and marketing, but to influence content, political elections, and harnessing emotions to keep us engaged on social media platforms. Now, how is this related to the failing of the marketplace of ideas? When the mode of delivery and consumption of news and information is an important factor in the ability of people to step out of the eco chamber, to be critical to promoting the marketplace of ideas, this is why this becomes important. So when news and information is consumed online, it is subject to increased data mining and behavior targeting I just detailed. Well, in 19, excuse me, in 2018, we learned that Facebook improperly allowed researchers unauthorized access to personal information accounts of over 70 million users in the United States and over 87 million worldwide. And while not all websites, apps, or platforms engage in such extensive tracking and profiling, when the largest media company in the world does, there is a concern. And these researchers amassed extracted, exploited consumer personal information, including the location of each consumer. This was valuable information that could be used to tailor messages that would persuade a particular person to attend a political event or vote for a political candidate. Now, at the time, I thought that this Cambridge Analytica expose scandal was only the tip of the iceberg for the abuse of user personal information. Regrettably, I was right. Personal information has been more exposed than I thought. More and more of that iceberg has been recently exposed. A few weeks ago, another whistleblower asserted that Facebook doesn't just track, profile, target its users to send targeted ads and content, but that it uses such profile to invoke certain emotions to users to keep them engaged with the platform. According to the whistleblower provoking anger and outrage from users generated more eyeballs and therefore more revenue. Now remember the Pew Research chart that ranks social media last for the level of trust? This is why people are staying engaged on social media. It's not trust, it's anger, and outrage. And this week it was reported that Facebook purposely ignored its own data and spread of misinformation. So if these assertions are true, and these are just news reports, millions of people have been manipulated and purposely driven to extreme emotions behavior merely for profit. 
this would be way beyond the intent and boundaries for standard advertising and marketing. Social media content and communications can also be distributed to consumers using automated bots. Bots can operate in partially or fully automatic mode and are often designed to mimic human users. Now there could be good bots, benevolent bots we call them, but many social media bots are used in dishonest and nefarious ways. And it's estimated they make up a sizable percentage of all accounts on social media. So when we are not exposed to other viewpoints and continue to receive only news and information that reinforces our beliefs, based or not on fact, and we are led to believe that there are many other like-minded people that agree with us, our online behavior can manifest itself in the real world in dangerous ways. And this is no longer a hypothetical exercise or philosophical debate. We're looking at the attack on Comet Pizza in Washington, DC, where a lone gunman attacked a neighborhood restaurant on the belief that it was a cover for a child pornography ring in the basement. Insurrectionists attacked the Capitol on January 6, in an attempt to stop the certification of the 2020 presidential election. Five people died and hundreds were injured on that day. And just a few weeks ago, a man from Maryland shot his pharmacist brother and his brother's wife to death in their home because the man believed that the COVID vaccine was killing people. He blamed his brother for administrating the vaccine. And across the country, volunteer members of election boards, school boards, elected officials are subject to death threats, stalking, and at risk of real personal harm. This speech is not free. We are all paying for it. So we did not get here overnight. And as I have illustrated, it's not just one event, one person, or one development that brings us to a crossroads today. A series of individual developments have contributed to a failing of the marketplace of ideas. The foreseen outcomes and inadvertent consequences of these developments have collectively converged into a perfect storm resulting in today's First Amendment crisis. So as you can see, consolidation of news and information sources, it's not just the loss of viewpoints, it's the loss of diverse and antagonistic viewpoints, minority and women ownership, erosion of trust, personal and impersonal communications, and advanced technology that doesn't just predict individual behavior, it influences such behavior. These are all issues of concern. So what are our next steps? I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful. And as long as we have journalists and reporters and committed news people across the board in all media that want to get to the truth, as long as we have citizens that put their own body at risk, like Darnella Frazier, who was the 17 year old who recorded the murder of George Floyd by the police. As long as we have people that are honest and will speak the truth, I'm hopeful that we can gain a little bit of this marketplace back. I still have hope that we can recover from these failings and at minimum restore civility in our daily discourse with each other. Now, I don't have all the answers. And if I did, I'd be making the rounds on cable and news television. But I will offer a few things for each of us to consider. And I emphasize there's no one silver bullet. This is a complex issue that needs a complex response. Two things to think about. I encourage you to take a good look at your own media consumption habits. I have made a concerted effort to expound my horizons, to seek other news and information sources, which is probably why I get email now from both sides of the political aisle. Now, 
I find this sometimes very difficult, no doubt. I have found myself yelling at the television, but then I'll change a channel and I'll try to find something online that I can read. But I really want to understand other viewpoints. But how do we encourage other people to break out of their echo chamber, to seek diverse and antagonistic sources? I can't help but think of the term of the phrase, I should say, that my grandmother used to say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So we need to build up trust and make the media less the enemy. So I think we need to put more local into local news. Now many local broadcasters, if not most, have made enormous commitments to their communities. One reason why local news ranks higher excuse me, on trust in other media. But I think more needs to be done. In fact, the National Association of Broadcasters has launched a campaign emphasizing the importance of trusted local journalists, broadcast news, fact-based journalism in local communities, citing to the misinformation on social media. I think we need to increase diversity in ownership, management, and decision makers. Now, the entire media industry is working to improve minority and gender ownership, but we can also look at management and decision makers. There's a lack of diversity in the newsroom and journalists and personnel as well. That's just as important as who owns this station. And we need to look at all media, not just broadcast television or radio, but across the board. We are again at a time of civil unrest. And unless we address these issues, I fear that we're gonna be facing some of the same issues that the Kerner Commission addressed back in 1967. Now, there has to be some place for public and private partnerships. The FCC is limited in its actions. Now, FCC acting chairwoman, and as of today, I believe it's Chairwoman Rosenworcel, she recharted the Communications Diversity and Equity Council. That's a start. But I also think the FCC needs to report out consistent statistics uh, on minority ownership and women ownership. And the last time a comprehensive report was done on broadcast ownership, media ownership, was 21 years ago. I was very honored to contribute to this report, um, but it is 20 years old, 21 years old. There needs to be a more complete analysis. We need to distinguish between news and opinion and to improve digital literacy. For media, better distinguish between news and facts and opinions. For citizens, think critically and don't believe everything you read or hear. Let's distinguish between speech that is appropriate under the marketplace theory and speech that is not, which may better fit the imminent lawless action theory. As I noted, First Amendment is supposed to protect the speech we don't like, not the speech we do, but there are still limits, even for political speech. These two in combination have a role for the private sector and government we should all be concerned about any government regulation of content, of any news or information platform, digital or analog. I don't necessarily want the government in the news business because that's a real slippery slope. There's less trust in the government than there is in the media. But I'm very concerned from a privacy and a constitutional perspective about the exponential increases in behavioral targeting, artificial intelligence, bots, predictive analysis without transparency. I question whether such advancements are being used to reinforce stereotypes, to discriminate, which negates the whole value of diversity. I'm concerned that, it, that such use can radicalize vulnerable people to dangerous viewpoints without impunity, solely to secure more eyeballs, clicks and advertising revenue. So there is a role for government. And that role really is to ensure that the technology 
and the methods that are used to target and deliver content to consumers does not violate our privacy or laws or regulations or discriminates, but it needs to do so in a very careful, a very controlled method. Otherwise we can do more harm than good. So the bottom line is there's a role for each of us. And in closing, I ask, can you imagine what our collective future will be if we continue on the same path of polarization and demonization of the press and the media? Can our political system and election process sustain more attacks? If so, for how long? Can we afford not to find new ways to foster an improved marketplace of ideas, civility, and be informed and respectful about diverse viewpoints? I, for one, cannot imagine an alternative. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. And as one of my favorite television shows, be careful out there. Thank you. Janelle, thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. Um, we have a lot of really interesting questions in the Q&A. And I'm going to do my best to sort of consolidate them because there is a, a constant theme here, which is that you pointed out the very real dangers with an unregulated social media community. But how would you go about regulating it? There was one point that was made that was essentially, you were talking about the problems of echo chambers and the suggestion was made that social media is really all about being an echo chamber because that's what people seek out. So we've got, I think, at least two issues here. One would be, do we need a fairness doctrine for social media, forcing social media to prevent, present diverse viewpoints? And then what I think is the even more intractable problem, which is what do we do about disinformation and misinformation? A couple of people pointed out that other countries have been criminalizing misinformation and disinformation, which I think would be very difficult to do under the First Amendment. I don't want to keep talking. I just want to put those questions before you and let you respond to them. Well, that, that's where the rubber meets the road. How do we get to where we need to be uh, without violating the First Amendment, as well as a, a host of other um, constitutional issues? And that's why I recommended the multiple suggestions that if we can try to make the new, local news and news, again, people had raised the issue about trust. So if we can generate more trust, I'm hoping that people will turn to different media and get back offline and maybe start to watch other sources or look at other sources. Um, I also think that there is an issue just with the fairness doctrine because as you noted, the whole reason for social media um, is to interact with your like-minded people. But if those like-minded people are automated bots, they're not like-minded people, that's the problem. Some of this information is being fed to you. So if there's a way that the government, again, carefully and controlled way um, to disclose what's, what's automated, what's not, what's a real person, what's not, again, I don't know the technology enough to know how we get there, but there's a problem if I'm sitting at my computer and I think that my crazy ideas are now reinforced by hundreds of people across the country and that's not necessarily the case. So I think we need to provide more opportunities for people to get to the truth. Uh, and that also means that mainstream media, uh, as, as much as I hate to say it, they need to stop picking up some of these crazy stories um, that now have made their way into the mainstream that now legitimizes some of these untruths to the extent that they no longer become, um, you can't tell the difference between, again, the opinion and fact. And I think that's a, that's not just a, marketplace of ideas issue, in many ways, that's an ethical issue for, for journalists and news media. How, when you report on a story, are you giving it more legs? Or are you giving it more 
visibility. We know people are interested in it, but is it really news? And that's a hard question. And that's a question each newsroom and each company is gonna to have to deal with. I mean, it, it sounds as if you're, you're still um, talking about self-regulation primarily, not so much government attempting to step in and decide what's truth, what's false. I, I think that's the biggest concern if we do something along the lines of criminalizing disinformation or so forth. But how do we persuade the social media companies to step up and act as editors? And what risks do they run from a uh, constitutional perspective and also from a business perspective if they start doing that? I think the first step is to know what their business practices are. I mean, I've read the news reports and I know that there's more coming, but I think there needs to be a deeper analysis on how these social media networks and how this technology works. So we understand better of how it's being targeted, how it's being served. Um, and that I think can be a government role. Um, I do think self-regulation at this point is helpful because I don't want government engaged in controlling content. I think that's very much a slippery slope. But if they can regulate or to uh, put guidelines in place for behavior, for how the technology is used, um, then that, and whether it's more disclosures or privacy disclosures, and note that even privacy disclosures need to be contained as well, because not every media company, not every website, not every app, not every social media network engages in certain practices. But those that do should have a higher degree uh, of care and a higher standard to disclose what they're doing. So if I knew from a user perspective that certain information was being shared and used and I'm getting automated messages and they're not coming from real people, I may reconsider how I feel about something. Again, I noted that this is a complex problem. There's no one silver bullet. Um, and I think there's so much about how technology is driving our choices and driving our behavior we don't know about. I'd like to have more information as a first step. And that's where I think the government's role is right now. I'd like to pivot for a minute to a slightly different angle. Um, we have a, what I think is a really intriguing question from one of my students, actually. Um, going back to the issue of minority ownership, particularly in the radio and television broadcast media, um, she writes that you have mentioned that there are fewer minority owners now than uh, was the case in the past. Um, but you also point out that young people don't use much broadcast media. They're mostly on social media. So is it possible, even likely, that young people are consuming more minority produced content today than was the case in the past? I think that is the case because we don't know how many websites or platforms or podcasts that are produced because it's not as expensive. You don't have to own a TV station or a radio station to distribute content. Yeah, so I do think that there's a lot more content online, um, but is it news and information content um, or is it entertainment? It could be a combination of both. So I do think there's more exposure to minority viewpoints, um, but it has such a small following. And when you look at the statistics that people are watching TV and getting their news from more mainstream sources, uh, and that's what's driving them, then I think that we have to look at ways to get those sources out more in the mainstream. Um, those audiences online for those individual minority owned websites or apps or podcasts um, or blogs even are very, 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 very small. Um, and they deserve more attention. They deserve more audience. Um, and, and that's again, a good thing about the internet that they can have a voice and a platform. Uh, but unfortunately they're not exposed to as many people. Um, going back to the issue of the marketplace of ideas, as you know, one of the um, proposals that has been floating around has been that one of the ways we can sort of civilize social media is to do away with anonymous speech um, on social media platforms, basically force people to use their real names and so forth. Um, what do you think about that as a possible solution to the problems you identify? I haven't really thought about that. 
Um, I think there could be pros and cons. I do think there's an issue with people hiding behind um, uh, false identities and anonymous, as I mentioned, uh, identification that they can be more harmful. I know so there are some websites and some social media platforms that require you to use your name. Uh, and that may be something to explore. I haven't thought about that fully, but I think there are pros and cons for both. That's probably a safe answer, <laughs> Janelle, to say that there are pros and cons for both, but I take your point. It's a very difficult uh, problem when we have the history that we do in this country of um, honoring the idea of anonymous political speech. But I mean, that's, part, that's part of our First Amendment as well, as not having to identify yourself. But, right. may, but maybe we have to take a look at <clears throat> what type of speech um, and, and that may be an approach uh, in terms of a way to get to, 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 to resolve the anonymity of hate speech um, or speech that can incite a more immediate attack or something. Maybe we have to draw the line at certain types of speech. But again, I think it's worth exploring and I haven't really thought that much about that. We have a couple of questions that I think are, are sort of asking for your personal views or your personal choices. One is a question which is, what do you consider to be paragons of journalism? I mean, what media sources do you think are, are the ones that, that we should all be turning to? I get this question a lot when I'm out speaking as well. And I, I do think that there's a hunger for people to, to have a sense that there are reliable sources out there. And then another question, which I also got last week when I was giving a talk at the University of Wisconsin in Menominee, what is your opinion of the so-called cancel culture? <laughs> um, I'm not gonna name any new news sources in speech because I represent so many different media clients and I don't think that would be in my best professional interest. Um, <laughs> but I try to read as many sources as I can. And the other thing I do is I like reading the newspaper, the actual newspaper, the paper paper, because then I can go through each page and look at and be, find an article that I had not even thought about searching for. I like the, the, the physical holding the paper because I'm online so much at work and I'm sitting in front of a computer screen. I'd rather put my feet up and light the fireplace and have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and really just read the entire newspaper. Um, but for cancel culture, I think there's a valid reason for people to personally boycott something. I am personally boycotting a couple of products and a couple of uh, media companies uh, that I haven't either liked their privacy policy or their business practices or they did something that I thought was just inexcusable. So, but I don't necessarily share that with everyone. I do it to make me feel better. And I don't want to support someone or financially support someone that I think is not serving the community well. So I have my own personal boycotts. Um, but just because you don't like something doesn't mean that you're encouraging the cancel culture. I don't think that just because you are opposed to a viewpoint means that you are seeking to cancel them. I think people need to take critical uh, criticism, uh, productive criticism, without stepping quickly into the cancel cancel culture. Um, uh, that's just as bad as fake news, in terms of coming out with something uh, that, that you don't like or you don't agree with, so you call it fake. Um, but I do think there's an appropriate place and time for either a boycott or a personal refusal to do business with someone. We are coming to the end of our time together. As much as I would love to get to all the questions that we have, I don't think we're gonna be able to do that this evening. But I do wanna give you a last word. You certainly touched on this in your formal presentation. Um, but uh, one of our uh, commenters has basically asked the question, how do you think we can best regain 
the lost marketplace of ideas? Well, I think by doing some of the suggestions that I mentioned, and I put those practices in place. And again, I mentioned that, that this is, there's no one silver bullet. Um, we have to be more respectful of people who disagree with us um, and try to look past that disagreement uh, and see them and we still respect their opinion. We don't respect different opinions anymore. Like I said, we've lost not just diversity, we've lost civility. Um, but at the same time, on a personal level, we need to look at what our own media practices are. If we, if everyone on this webinar looked at a different media source, went to a different page or watched a different news source, magazine, TV, whatever, than you did yesterday, and you do one a week or even one a month, I would even say one a year at this point, we will have started to increase the marketplace of ideas. Um, and whether that's a source that you've never heard before or a source that you've heard, but you just refuse to look at them, why not take another chance? I'm just asking people to step out the box, step out of your echo chamber, uh, really try to look past this. There's so much more at stake than our own different viewpoints and our own divergent political beliefs. Um, not that we're gonna always get along. That's, that's the nature of how this country was built. We went through an entire American revolution to get to where we are. But we certainly can't continue to operate the way we do now. We cannot continue to operate in our, with closed minds um, and, and just having limited clicks and limited sources that we go to. Well, I certainly would agree that we can't expect to retain our democratic system if that happens. And thank you for that call to arms. I think it's a really important message for everybody attending this uh, webinar tonight. Janelle, I just wanna thank you for giving us so many things to think about. This has been such a rich, uh, nuanced conversation. Um, as you said, you don't have all the answers, but I think you've given us a lot to think about and to consider. So thank you so much for giving us your time this evening and giving us all these wonderful ideas. This has been a marketplace of ideas this evening. So thank you for that. In, indeed, I hope so. Again, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I wanted to give everyone something to think about. Well, I think you have more than succeeded in that task. So thank you again so very much. Thank you uh, to the Silla family who made this presentation possible this evening and to the support of the director of the HSJMC, Dr. Alicia Cohen. Thank you to our audience for attending this evening. I'm, I'm seeing, thank you, thank you, thank you in the chat. Everybody's <laughs> just loved your presentation, Janelle. Really wonderful, I can't think of a better uh, really talk to kind of kick off some of our public life conversations. And thank you, um, Janelle, for all that you've brought, brought to this conversation. So Cohen, just- It has been such a pleasure. And Jane, I'm looking forward to us getting together over a glass of wine and without a computer. <laughs> It'll be so nice, wouldn't it? I think we're all eager for that. Um, just a reminder for everyone attending that this lecture has been recorded and we'll be editing it a little bit and posting it on the Scylla Center YouTube channel sometime in the next week or so. So stay tuned for that. And we hope to see you again next year at our Scylla lecture. There's a brief poll that has just been posted. And if you would not uh, res mind responding to that, we would welcome your response. We're inviting you to tell us how you heard about the Scylla Lecture and whether you'd like to be added to our mailing list. Please let us know and we'll keep you informed of the activities we're undertaking as well. So with that, I will thank you all for your attending and uh, say good night and goodbye. Thank you. Be careful out there.